today's program. I will introduce this session and I, in the introduction, I will explain what EcoShape is for the people who don't know that. Then we will have Dr. Katharine Terbiska von Scheltinga as a speaker. She will go into uh, Bangladesh. She will present Bangladesh to us as a Delta country. Dr. Hasib Irfanula, he will uh, explain uh, the state of the art of nature-based solutions and in Bangladesh and how Bangladesh is dealing with them and developing them. And then we will have uh, Professor uh, Salim Rook, who will uh, explain to us what the ambitions of Bangladesh in this field are and which initiatives they are undertaken, undertaking in this field. And afterwards, we will have a Q&A and a panel discussion with all the speakers. So let me start with my introduction. Um, well, today's webinar is about Bangladesh. And the question is, is Bangladesh or will Bangladesh be a world leader in the development and application of nature-based solutions? We organized this webinar because we think that the answer to this question is an unambiguous yes. Bangladesh has rapidly developed into a world leader in climate adaptation and delta management, including the application of nature-based solutions. And this is amongst others demonstrated by their vastly increased resilience towards major hurricanes over the last decades. And uh, in my opinion, Bangladesh has the means, the intellectual <coughs> capacity, the leadership and the opportunities of... Cheers, can you please switch off your microphone? Offered by their physical environment to assume this leading role and be an inspiration to all of us. And we can all benefit from learning from their examples. And therefore, I'm proud that today we have these three prominent speakers who will enlighten us uh, as to where Bangladesh stands with regard to nature-based solutions. Um, the organization of this webinar is done by the EcoShape Foundation. EcoShape is a foundation under Dutch law, managing the public-private innovation program Building with Nature. And we developed the Building with Nature concept uh, based on uh, phys physical pilot projects. Building with nature solutions, I, I must say that we are uh, mainly active in the field of uh, coast deltas and rivers, eh, so in the water sector. Building with nature solutions harness the forces of nature to benefit economy, society and the environment. Uh, uh, they also make use of natural processes as much as possible and where we have to build something, uh, we will do that in a way that will benefit uh, uh, the local ecosystem uh, and social system. This program is organized uh, by various sectors, public, private, uh, knowledge institute and NGOs collaborating uh, with a shared ambition. And we have uh, at the moment 12 years of experience in implementing uh, building with nature or nature-based solutions concepts in practice. We support our work with fundamental knowledge development where possible. And what we learn from our pilot projects and from this fundamental knowledge development, we have translated into practical design guidelines, which you can find on our website. Uh, you can use them for the development of your own nature-based solutions. And everything we do is aimed at upscaling and mainstreaming this concept. Um, now, we worked in uh, six different landscapes. Uh, you can find this uh, on our website and you can find the background of that. We also wrote a book uh, uh, where we uh, described how, how we did it and what the results were. And we tested uh, uh, all kinds of uh, building with nature concepts in uh, the various landscapes. And well, in this figure, these building with nature concepts are represented by visuals. Uh, and uh, in the book and on the website, you can find how we applied these concepts in uh, the six landscapes that we studied. Conclusion was that uh, building with nature solutions or nature-based solutions for the water sector are uh, viable alternatives to uh, the present practice, but there are still enablers that we need to uh, work on uh, to create a favorable uh, environment for these uh, solutions. And we need to know more about the technology of, uh, of these uh, nature-based solutions and system knowledge. We, need, we will we, need to know how to work in the multi-stakeholder approach. We need uh, innovative management, monitoring and maintenance practices, 
Institutional embedding is important. Uh, Nature-based solutions, they often touch upon uh, more uh, societal issues and uh, produce benefits on more uh, aspects than uh, traditional infrastructure. So also uh, more institutes are involved and that's often complicated to, to align them all. The business case is important, who pays, uh, what are the costs and what do uh, these solutions bring us? And last but not least, capacity building is uh, important. We need to raise the new generation of engineers, ecologists and social scientists to, to produce these uh, solutions. Now, um, uh, for further information, I would like to refer you to our website, ecoshape.org, uh, where you can find interviews by leading uh, experts, uh, records of roundtable discussions we held on several topics. You can download white papers, for instance, on how to deal with uncertainty, uh, how to scale up investment. Um, and you can take a look at the various pilots and uh, delve deeper into our uh, guidelines. Uh, we also uh, are uh, maintaining a community of like-minded uh, individuals, people who have the ambition to advance this concept. This community is supported by a LinkedIn group, uh, which is called Ecoshape Building with Nature. So if you are interested to, uh, uh, to join this community, uh, yeah, please uh, uh, let us know and we will, uh, we will make you part of this community. So that's about uh, Ecoshape, the background information. And uh, now I would like to introduce uh, the first speaker to you. Uh, Ms. Catherine uh, Terwischa van Scheltinga. Uh, she is a senior researcher of water management in Deltas at Wageningen University and Research. Also the, the director of the project office and uh, international secretariat at uh, Bangladesh, uh, in, in Dhaka, Bangladesh, of the Delta Alliance. Uh, she is an international water professional with a transdisciplinary focus, uh, combining knowledge areas like water management, climate change, gender, uh, education, irrigation, agriculture policy, and all of them related to change processes. And that's exactly what we need uh, to advance uh, 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 yeah, this, these novel concepts such as nature-based solutions. Katharine, can I give you the floor? Uh, yes, thank you uh, yes. very much, uh, Hank. Uh, can you confirm that you can see my screen, the slide? Yes, we can see it. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon to all. Um, uh, while the main focus, of course, of the discussion is about nature-based solutions, uh, you might wish to get a quick overview of Bangladesh and its delta, and I've been asked to give you that introduction. Uh, I will do so uh, as quickly as possible um, with as few slides as possible. That's always a bit of a challenge. Uh, let's start with that. Um, can you see the next slide? Yeah. Uh, for most people, uh, you know where Bangladesh is. Uh, it has a population of around 170 million people. It's about uh, uh, four to five times the size of the Netherlands uh, as a comparison for Dutch people so that you know. Uh, and it's a growing country. Uh, it already uh, achieved the middle income uh, status and it is uh, working towards uh, being a developed country by 2041. Uh, when thinking about Delta, uh, I also feel the need to kind of um, clarify the terminology a bit because what are we talking about when we talk about the Delta? Well, it d depends very much on which expert you talk to. Uh, the water experts, of course, will uh, say about the Delta being where the river comes to the sea. Uh, but for instance, if you talk to um, uh, the, the, the morphologist, then especially the sediment part uh, is an important part of uh, what is a delta and what is not. Now also, uh, how far is then, uh, which part of Bangladesh then exactly is a delta? Uh, also there you can have many uh, definition issues um, and it's not always clear. I gave an example here uh, of a recent paper where two thirds of Bangladesh was considered a delta. Some people only say that the coastal 
uh, districts are the delta. Uh, in the case of the delta plan, uh, the, actually the whole country uh, is considered a delta. I think also it's it's not a matter of uh, uh, that it can only be one uh, definition, but I think it's good to be aware that there are various definitions of deltas and uh, we just need to deal with that. Now the GBM basin, the, the uh, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna, these are the three big rivers in South Asia and all kind of come to Bangladesh before uh, coming into the sea. The discharge of that is about kind of 20 times what comes from the River Rhine. Uh, so uh, just to give you an uh, idea about the order of magnitude, <coughs> And that also means that rivers can be very small, but can be very big as well. A five to 10 kilometer width for a river is possible uh, in Bangladesh. So you can also imagine that if people from Bangladesh come to the Netherlands and they see the River Rhine at Wageningen, where I live, they think, what kind of small dish is this? Um, but well, the, the, the order of magnitude is important when thinking about what is going on in that delta. There are issues related to kind of flooding, but also related to drought. There is erosion on the one hand, but also sedimentation on the other. Uh, there are issues around uh, water quality, for instance, uh, with increasing salinity levels, but also uh, around the cities and with industries polluting. Um, and then uh, altogether also for, for the whole uh, area, uh, how to kind of uh, manage this in a sustainable governance issue is also a huge challenge. Uh, just to give you a bit more concrete details, uh, showing you the flooding levels over the last uh, 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 50 to 70 years. Floods in Bangladesh is both a positive and a negative aspect. Actually, it's, it's a normal thing in life. Uh, for a lot of people in Bangladesh, but as people increasingly live in cities, then also flooding is increasingly a problem um, because the positive aspect of flooding, uh, that you have more fertile land for fertile crops and that you have nature areas uh, that kind of uh, use that water to renew, then that also is, is uh, different for different people. So who suffers and who is affected by it? That's very much uh, of where you are located. And then that's not only a kind of physical aspect, also there is a kind of a development related aspect to it because it are the poorest people who are living in the most inconvenient places with regards to flooding. Then uh, with regard to water management, uh, how to kind of map the different uh, elements, uh, around the bigger rivers, of course, you see the most flooding issues uh, around the coast um, that uh, due to cyclones, there may be storm surges. You see the line of the, uh, the isohyets and the, the, the intrusion of the salinity. That's a seasonal aspect uh, uh, to it because uh, in the rainy season, the water um, from the rivers in a way pushes the salinity front more towards the coast while in the drier season uh, the salinity kind of creeps in uh, and it has a climate change aspect uh, the salinity and at the same time it has a development related aspect because if upstream the water is used for other purposes then the salinity can move further into the country. In the north uh, western part of the country uh, the, the area is more drought prone. It has to relate is also a relation to the soil condition, while in the northeastern and eastern side also the flash floods uh, are occurring when water comes from the hilly areas uh, into the floodplain and can create kind of flooding at very short notice. Um, when you think about uh, uh, all these uh, challenges, I think the main thing is also to look at the trends. What is kind of going on? Bangladesh is a very dynamic country and actually many things are happening at the same time, which also makes it when you do research uh, very challenging because researchers like to know exactly what is going on. But by the time you know it exactly, already the situation will have changed. So how to move in that, that's also a kind of challenge in itself. 
Um, if I, I, I think about land use changes, uh, for instance, in agriculture, over the last 50 to 70 years, while the population kind of doubled, rice production in a way tripled. So Bangladesh is far more able to feed itself than it was in the past. Uh, also, the development that you see is that actually the area for agriculture is decreasing. Uh, or that also has to do with um, the cities kind of increasing. But in that agricultural land, the, 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 the change is also from kind of low risk, low yield, low input crops, like for instance rice, towards more kind of high risk, high yield, high input crops, like for instance broccoli or flowers, etc. And this happens in different places in the country. And then also the uh, aquaculture has been increasing uh, over the last uh, 50 years with, with more kind of uh, fish production in ponds, while at the same time, if you look at the fish um, that is coming uh, from the, the natural water bodies, there there is a kind of decrease because of overfishing uh, in those bodies. Uh, cities have been increasing, forests uh, are kind of reducing in size. Wetlands is again not easy to say uh, um, uh, in few words what is happening there. Um, uh, for instance, if I show you the map of the flooding situation, well, this is a, just a, a momentary picture of uh, 1998, but it shows very clearly uh, the, the big rivers uh, and the flooding around it. But also you see the kind of northwest, uh, northeastern area where the Howers are, which is an area where there is a lot of uh, flooding in the rainy season. It's a kind of low lying and also sinking area, but uh, with on the right hand side, the land use, you see there is a clear connection to what is uh, going on in that area as compared to the flooding situation. Now, all these changes are in a way a combination of uh, that Bangladesh is on the move, the development is ongoing, while at the same time it is facing climate change, so it, it needs to adjust. So it, it's, it's uh, all the um, activities uh, well, can in, in a way not seen separately, that this is always happening both at the same time. Uh, I already mentioned to you uh, poverty and how poverty levels are dropping. I think this is a kind of tremendous achievement of Bangladesh. You can see the uh, over the last uh, 25 years how uh, uh, poverty levels are being halved. Uh, of course, you need to take into account that uh, if you um, think in poverty in, uh, in absolute numbers, then still these are kind of a lot of people who are still poor. But there is a huge also spread over the country uh, with some areas being uh, more ahead of others. Uh, there are poor people in all places, but some places are more poor than others. Now, uh, I've also been asked to tell you something in a nutshell about the Bangladesh Delta Plan, uh, because that's also one of the things going on uh, in the Delta, where uh, the government has in 2018 kind of approved this longer term integrated uh, strategic plan. You can find the, the, the text of the plan and the background studies all in the government website, which I have referred to uh, in the slide. Uh, but what is so special about the Delta Plan, what I like to explain is that if you think about DACA, let's say uh, 50 to 70 years ago, then if people who lived in Dhaka at that time, if you would have told them that, OK, this is going to happen and in 2020 we will be uh, at such and such a, a, a level, people would not have believed you. So if you think about kind of 50 to 100 years ahead, it's quite kind of unimaginable for people what could be happening. Uh, and uh, so it is uh, it is new to kind of think about that and also act upon it. Uh, but easily you can think when you think about water infrastructure, what is the kind of benefit of that? That if today uh, you create, um, uh, if you improve the sewage lines, for instance, in one of the areas in Dhaka, that is something that is not to cater only to solve the problem of today, but that sewage line will be there for the next 
30, 40, 50 years. So actually it needs to cater for the future. Well, in the past, if Bangladesh was poor, then the, of course uh, you need to deal with the immediate problems. Uh, and even there you may not have uh, enough resources. But as I told you, Bangladesh is kind of developing. There is more build up infrastructure, especially in the cities. So then also the, the question comes to mind, how are you going to deal with that towards the future? Well, there is a clear vision from the side of the government and uh, for a prosperous Bangladesh. So this plan is in a way a first step on thinking about how you can go there. Uh, one of the steps that uh, that is new, for instance, is to think about scenarios uh, that you kind of, um, uh, though you know that the future is uncertain, you try to kind of see uh, with, for instance, the uh, uh, water conditions, uh, what could be that future on the lower end, on the higher end, and what could be uh, the economy on the lower end and the higher end, and then what could be what we are looking at for the future. And you will then find that certain um, measures, certain programs are anyway a good idea to work on. While on the other hand, also some will only work in certain conditions, but not in other. So those kind of investments you might wish to kind of um, uh, wait a bit for towards the future. Another part of that uh, Delta uh, uh, plan is also that um, uh, information data uh, has been brought together. People have been working actively on getting um, the information into a knowledge portal. Uh, I'm giving you the link here and also kind of currently I'm working with uh, colleagues in Bangladesh on creating an app so that you can have this information even in your pocket, so to speak, uh, with an app. You find it uh, the better version in the Google Play Store and we are of course uh, looking for your feedback on it because these things are work in progress as we speak. Back to that uh, plan uh, and the, the kind of strategies that then come out of this. These strategies are at a national level. They are kind of thematic, but also kind of hotspot oriented where you then uh, have for different areas in the country uh, uh, indications or where you could go towards the future. Uh, so for instance, if you think about the coastal zone, then you will uh, wish to deal with uh, increased uh, um, uh, possibilities of damage through cyclone or uh, salinity damage in future. So how do you want to deal with it? For the uh, Barint and Drought Pond area, you are kind of looking at how do you uh, deal with the agricultural development in that area combined with that uh, increased uh, risk for, for drought, uh, etc. And uh, for all these strategies, you need to have a kind of uh, um, starting point. And the starting point that was taken in, by, uh, in the Delta plan is uh, with adaptive Delta management. Uh, you can in a way have uh, the water guiding the strategy so you follow uh, what the water does or you can have kind of people controlling uh, what the water does uh, and anything in between and i think this is a kind of uh, interesting stepping stone towards the topic of nature-based solutions because their nature-based solutions of course fits very well and as hank already said there are many kind of preconditions to make it work uh, and also bangladesh is working on that so that brings us to the next speaker uh, on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen, for uh, your very concise but very complete and uh, uh, I must say uh, impressive overview of uh, Bangladesh as a Delta country. Uh, but you touched, true to your uh, profile, you touched upon many disciplines and. Uh, it's a, a very complete overview for which I would like to thank you. Um, I did not receive any questions yet, so we can proceed uh, with our next speaker, Mr. Hasid Irfanula. Um, uh, Mr. Irfanula uh, uh, is an independent consultant working on environment, climate change and uh, uh, research systems. He has worked for different uh, international environmental 
and development organizations, academic and research institutes, donor and the government of Bangladesh in different capacities. And his working areas include natural resource management, biodiversity conservation, community based adaptation, disaster risk management, capacity building on research systems and translating research into policy and action. But, uh, that's uh, that especially the last thing is uh, very close to my heart eh? we, as a director of a research program. Uh, I would like to see things uh, being put into practice. So I'm looking very much forward to uh, your presentation, uh, Asip. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, my net is quite uh, unstable. So please bear with me if you uh, if I dropped out for, for, for a while. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for setting the scene. You now know, all know Bangladesh, so it will be easier for me to share some information about uh, nature-based solution and Bangladesh. So the first thing is, uh, let us very quickly go through the uh, definition. There are quite a few definitions that are available. What do we mean by nature-based solution? Well, our society, uh, we, in our society, we face so many different societal challenges, uh, starting with uh, climate change, uh, poverty, food and water insecurity, as well as biodiversity loss. So nature-based solutions, as defined by IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature, these are the actions against those challenges. It could be protecting, sustainably managing, restoring both natural and modified ecosystems, keeping in mind those challenges. But the most important thing is we have to get two types of benefit out of nature-based solutions. Otherwise, you can't call it nature-based solution. One is human well-being, the other is biodiversity. Benefit. In the first part of my uh, presentation, I will be sharing with you some examples from Bangladesh on nature-based solutions. Uh, I will be pointing out what kind of or what types of societal challenges these, these particular nature-based solution interventions are uh, trying to overcome. So what's the type of nature-based solution like protection, management, restoration, creation, and what type of ecosystems we are talking about, forest, wetland, coast, and here. So let us start with our uh, very famous mangrove forest, Sundarbans, which is uh, shared between Bangladesh and India. Uh, it is not only that while protecting this uh, magnificent uh, Sundarban, we are sequestering carbon only, but it is also a means to uh, achieve long term uh, tackling long or coping with long term changes that we are expecting under the changing climate. As Catherine mentioned that cyclonic uh, uh, cyclones. Uh, and uh, as well as uh, tidal surges are quite frequent. In Bangladesh, so it is part of your social condition and it is also a Ramsar site. But protection Protecting uh, a forest, uh, yes, it is nature-based solution if we can get a human benefit as well as biodiversity benefit. By, but I'd like to tell you a quick story. What is happening uh, over the last couple of decades, Bangladesh has been practicing protected area co-management. It means involving people to manage protected areas, mostly forest as well as some wetlands. So with USAID funding since 2003, Nishorgo Support Project or IPAC in, uh, uh, Integrated Protected Area Co-Management or recently completed CREL Project, which is Climate Resilient Ecosystems and Livelihoods. We try to bring together all the stakeholders to manage these protected areas. That is, that's why it is called uh, uh, co-management. But it got legal footing when in 2017 the protected area management rules were uh, enacted or formulated. So this particular story tells us that although uh, initially it was project driven, but it took a while to mainstream these uh, governance concept and uh, that's, that's the way things might happen. So you have to wait to make nature based solution mainstream. It is not only protected area in the forest, but also in the wetland. This fantastic uh, photograph was taken from the same spot by me, and you can see this particular wetland can become a sea in monsoon, but in a very, but a kind of drier area 
in um, uh, drier months. This project uh, uh, took place in Tangwar Hau, which is another Ramsar site. This community-based sustainable management of this wetland, initially funded by SDC, Swiss Development Agency for Cooperation, for 10 years. But later on, the government picked it up and it started funding on its own for a couple of years. So this particular example shows that uh, although initially it take a while or you need uh, development partners money to start off with a new innovative approach, but government can, uh, uh, a country like Bangladesh, which is in transition as Catholic state, becoming lower, uh, lower middle income country to upper middle income country. So uh, this particular example of co-management of or community-based sustainable management of an wetland tells us that shift also create uh, ecosystems and uh, coastal afforestation is one of the fantastic examples that we have on the coast. But as a, a different, uh, two different aspects. Although we started a, uh, uh, coastal afforestation, creating a green belt uh, in the middle of uh, uh, 1960s, but it turned into a different story over the last 15 years or so. I have put some uh, name of the name of some projects, coastal afforestation projects, and you can see that all the blue words in the title of those projects are about people, their participation, their livelihood, their engagement, and all the red words. These are uh, uh, depicting climate change. So you can see, although initially we never heard of climate change in the 60s, we, we didn't discuss it in our policy, in our plan, in our coastal administration. Maybe disaster is written, obviously. But now it has got a new momentum, new shift. Uh, uh, that is a very interesting story uh, to be told from Bangladesh when we talk about coastal administration. Agriculture itself is not a nature-based solution. It's part of natural resource management because, as we have seen the definition, often conventional, uh, the way we uh, uh, do our agriculture, it focuses on productivity and it doesn't focus much on diversity. But I would like to share with you this particular example, uh, my favorite one, floating agriculture, which was traditionally been practiced in South Central Bangladesh, uh, the map, uh, the darker green dot on the map on the left. But later on, over the last two decades, we have realized that this is also an ecosystem-based adaptation to climate change because under changing climate, water is getting, uh, uh, flood is getting, becoming a bit longer. So you have to do something to tackle this waterlogged condition. And uh, the beds, just to, just to uh, satisfy your interest, these beds are made up of water hyacinth, which is an invasive species. So you are using an invasive species, uh, you are actually managing it, controlling it. And the way production, uh, agricultural production uh, happens on these, it also have positive biodiversity impact on the water body. So in that sense, since it is uh, offering positive benefits to uh, people as well as the nature, so we can call it a nature-based solution. But it, ha it has now spread all over the country through different uh, big projects uh, funded by the government and other donors. Now I would like to take you to another part of Bangladesh, southeastern part of Bangladesh, where you may have heard that uh, Rohingya refugees are staying for more than four years now. They started coming in August 2017. Rohingyas are the Muslim minorities who, uh, who left, about one million of them. They left their country, Myanmar, which is a neighboring country of Bangladesh. They used to stay, most, most of them stayed in Rakhine state uh, because the, uh, the country, Myanmar, is denying their citizenship and they, they were facing a persecution. So what happened when we, uh, Bangladesh sheltered these one million people, uh, the whole area changed, as you, as you can see from the uh, from the uh, 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 photograph on the left. Uh, it slopes uh, became so uh, what do you call it? So so risky to stay on. But on right hand side, nature-based solution applied. 
testing were done and vetiver grass, uh, nap of visible vetiver grass was created, so these leguminous plants were planted. So this is a part of how nature-based solution is being implemented there. Of course, there are other interventions like uh, plantation, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of examples on how, how flood is tackled in that area. Stream banks are protected. As you can see, the two comparative uh, two, two photographs before and after, how fantastic, how green the whole area are uh, have become. On the right hand side, wetlands uh, were created in certain parts uh, in the surrounding area of those camps so that water can be retained, flood water, so that they don't enter into the uh, camp. Uh, Hasib, you got muted. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, so we can we can see we can we do not have many examples of nature-based solution in urban areas, but uh, this particular one is from Dhaka. How a wet a wetland was restored so that flood or water logging condition could be uh, tackled. Uh, in Bangladesh, in Dhaka city. The final example I would like to share where uh, Wageningen University was involved in coastal area of Bangladesh, where the oyster uh, breakwater reefs uh, were piloted um, uh, over the last few years so that it is not only a concrete structure, it's become a living country concrete structure with, with a small biodiversity ecosystem is created. And as you can see in the back of the, these reefs, artificially created reefs, water is much more calmer and uh, mangrove forest can, can be regenerated, uh, can be regenerated there. So it's a fantastic nature-based solution example from Bangladesh. Now, if we see all these examples, how our plans, how our policies are being adopting nature-based solutions. That is a good question. Let me start quickly start off with the latest document that we submitted in UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention to Climate Change. Bangladesh promised by submitting this document, national determined contribution, that it will reduce 7% greenhouse gas emission by 2030 um, uh, if you know, uh, on its own, if external support is received, it could be 22%. But if you look into the forestry chapter or forestry section of that document, which was submitted just a month back, uh, it talks about nature-based solution, people's involvement. Whatever the examples I have given, many of those are um, presented, uh, are uh, listed here. But is it the only plan? No, this is not the only plan. I have, uh, we have consulted the uh, Biodiversity Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan which is a fantastic document guiding our climate change adaptation and mitigation efforts. Uh, when you consult the 8-5 plan, uh, we are in the middle of it. If you consider the Muji Climate Prosperity Plan 2030, which is which will be out quite soon, uh, which is uh, which will help us to become an upper middle income country at the end of this decade. If we think of the Prosperity Plan of Bangladesh, which is um, guiding us to become a high income country in 20 years time. And of course, uh, 80 years long plan that uh, Catherine mentioned, all in fact talks about or indicate ecosystem based approaches. They don't, of, of course, they don't mention nature based solution per se, but ecosystem based approaches are there. But is it just a few words in our plans? No, Bangladesh is also investing money. This year, this financial year, uh, 2021 to 2022, Bangladesh government has allocated $3 billion, which is more than 4% of its annual budget, national budget, and of almost 1% of its GDP. But it is difficult to identify which are nature-based solutions, but we can understand that there is a fantastic opportunity to integrate nature-based solutions in all our uh, climate adaptation mitigation activities. I would like to end with two slides. Uh, one is challenges and the other is opportunity. Challenges, well, 
yes, nature-based solution is recognized, but uh, do we really know which one can be called nature-based solution and which are not? We also need to uh, appreciate the limitations of nature-based solution. It is not a simple thing, definitely not. That's why we need to recognize that sometimes it is, especially in a country like Bangladesh, it is we need green, gray-green mix or green, gray and blue mix solution, not only the green solution. The other uh, 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 challenge is creating Bangladeshi evidence. Uh, it means that whether nature-based solutions are effective, cost-effective, are they producing co-benefits, we don't need to rely upon what is happening in other parts of the world, but what is happening here, that would be easier to convince our uh, policymakers and development partners and other stakeholders. So that's why, although the plans are appreciating ecosystem-based approaches, we need to focus on how to mainstream NBS in our project design, how to how to make uh, NBS appreciated by our procurement rules and policies, our enemy systems, putting people in the center of nature-based solution always, not just uh, for sake of putting them in. Uh, at the design phase, implementation phase, management phase, and of course, beneficiary phases. And finally, money. Money is needed or allocated and spent not only during implementing the nature-based solution, but nature-based solution is a long-term thing. Project will end in three, five years time, but if you want to get benefit, long-term benefit out of nature-based solution, you need to invest on a long-term basis, which is called adaptive management. What are the opportunities? Yes, uh, Catherine has rightly mentioned Bangladesh is one of the most climate vulnerable countries. We are at the seven for the last couple of years uh, in terms of climate vulnerability, uh, report prepared by German Watch. But we have seen that NBS or ecosystem based approaches are mainstream in our plans. And those plans show the vision of resilient and prosperous Delta. And we do have long term experience in. Uh, conducting or managing uh, projects which are community-based NRM, natural resource management, or community-based adaptation or ecosystem-based adaptation. We can capitalize on that. And uh, last uh, September, last year, the Regional Office of South Asia, uh, uh, South Asian Office of Global Commission on Adaptation, GCA, which has got its headquarters in Rotterdam, it has been opened. So all of these creates the opportunity, the space where nature-based solution uh, expertise, the experiences, the innovation that we have through nature-based solution Bangladesh network can can conduct research, generate knowledge, and use those uh, uh, evidence pieces of evidence to build the capacity as well as influence the policy and practice through evidence-informed policy and influence, uh, practice influencing. And we can we can talk with the government agencies, the development partners, the NGOs, private sectors, and of course other entities. And finally, we need to engage people to make our NBS inclusive. We need to think beyond the project, making our uh, adaptive management uh, uh, inbuilt, and of course not only piloting but scaling things up. Uh, you can visit this particular website uh, that was uh, developed by ICAD. We will hear from the director of ICAD Dr. Salim, uh, in a minute. And uh, we can, you can also follow us uh, on Twitter at NBS Bangladesh. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Asif, for an excellent presentation. And uh, looking at it, uh, it, during my holiday, I read a book about uh, that the Netherlands used to be a very well planned country uh, in the 1970s, 80s and 90s. Uh, and how we lost that, uh, that capability. And I think that you uh, showed us how Bangladesh uh, has, uh, yeah, can actually be an example how to, uh, how to recoup that uh, capability. Um, there were a few questions. Um, there was a question by uh, Mr. Steve Newman, uh, where I can obtain a list of geo-reference examples in Bangladesh. I don't know, Asif, is there an easy answer to that? What we also could do is, uh, after Mr. Newman can send his contact details to info at ecoshape.nl, 
uh, are very registered for the for the webinar, then we will come back to it. Uh, sure, sure, that would be that, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so Steve, please send us a message, and we will answer your two questions uh, on uh, courses on MBS and the list of georeference examples. Then there is a question by uh, Nuru Kadir about how to, is it possible to convert uh, a polder into a form of nature-based solution? I would uh, suggest that we answer that after the presentation by Mr. Hook, uh, because that, that maybe there's more to say about it than a single answer. Um, and then uh, Mr. Newman also has an example of endowment, uh, asking for uh, examples of endowment function funding for adaptive uh, management in uh, Bangladesh. So maybe we could also uh, talk a, a little bit about that uh, after the presentation of Mr. Hook. So Steve, I will not forget it. Uh, uh, and uh, Mr. Ezas uh, Sheik, um, we, we are watching you uh, walk through a landscape. Can you please switch off your, web, off your camera? Uh, did you have a question? Because you have a raised hand. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Henk and the speakers, audiences and listeners. I'm one of the licensed listeners far away from the events, basically from Melbourne, Australia. I've okay. actually uh, got the invitations uh, uh, to a social media group. Uh, I thought it was a good time to actually say hello to everyone and uh, and uh, ask a few questions. And I was I was actually clean listening uh, all the presentations. And during the last presentation, uh, I noticed some of the examples. It's really uh, eye opener for people uh, living uh, outside of Bangladesh, in particular, uh, uh, the natural based solutions. And these are it. It demands or deserves some kind of considerations uh, in the policy making uh, uh, area. Definitely. Uh, my question is: is that uh, particularly while selecting uh, or prioritizing uh, major projects in Bangladesh in particular, uh, when the project goes to ECNEC for funding, can uh, anyone tell me, do we have, uh, have we prepared any kind of uh, biodiversity uh, guidelines or any kind of environmental threshold which will uh, tell uh, the decision maker that which projects will actually be disqualified for getting further consideration of funding or not. For example, I'm just giving you uh, that. Uh, uh, Mr. Sheikh, uh, example, yep. sorry, can I interrupt yeah, you? Yeah, so, okay, I yes. noted your question. Um, I propose yeah. that we uh, uh, continue now with the presentation uh, by Mr. Hook. Uh, because it's a very valid question, it's an interesting question, and it's also a good question, I think, for the discussion afterwards. So I propose that we uh, handle that question after the presentation by Mr. Kuhn. And I also see the raised hand by Burhadi Ani Namirudin. I also suggest that we uh, handle that question after the presentation by Mr. Kuhn. So if you will allow me, I would like to invite Mr. Kuhn. Uh, to uh, give his presentation. And Mr. Klein, I think your camera is still, of your microphone is open. Would you please close it? Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, the next speaker is Dr. S uh, Professor Dr. Salimon Hook. Uh, I'm very proud that he agreed to join this webinar. Um, uh, because I see on, uh, on open publications uh, that he is, uh, yeah, in my opinion, uh, a thought leader, an opinion leader on climate adaptation, nature-based solutions. Very active in, uh, uh, yeah, in many uh, international uh, summits. He's the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh. Also holds a senior fellow position at the International Institute for Environmental environment and development in Oxford. His expertise is on the link between climate change and sustainable development, particularly from the perspective of developing countries. Um, and recent activities of Mr. Hook have focused on building negotiation capacity and supporting the engagement of the least developed countries in the UNFCCC, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change. 
Um, so uh, I'm sure that Mr. Hook will have uh, some uh, yeah, uh, things we need to take uh, to heart. So please, uh, Salim, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Hank, and uh, thank you to EcoShape for organizing this event and inviting me. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to have any slides to present. I'll just share some thoughts and I will uh, build on the two excellent presentations, one by Catherine and one by Hasib, uh, in terms of uh, uh, describing the situation in Bangladesh in the past, in the present and in the future. Um, and I will uh, pick on three aspects that I think are relevant and uh, have already been um, addressed by uh, Catherine and Hasi, but I will I will build on that uh, foundation that they have laid. Uh, the first one is the issue of planning and implementation of plans. Uh, Hasib in his last slide, uh, last couple of slides showed a number of uh, uh, plans in Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh has a very strong planning uh, tradition, a very strong planning ministry. They produce five-year plans. We are currently in our eighth five-year plans. Uh, these are very um, significant planning processes. They collect together uh, the uh, views of different ministries, put them into a five-year plan. And the five-year plans are actually very, very, um, I would say rigid in the sense that even if we have a change of government in the middle of a five-year plan, the new government can't do much uh, till the next five-year plan if they want to do something new. Uh, so the five-year plans are really our main vehicle for planning and implementation. And then beyond the five-year plans, we also have some longer term plans. We have a, uh, a perspective plan to 2041, which is the time frame in which Bangladesh wants to graduate from being a, a least developed country into a middle income country. And we heard about the Delta plan from uh, uh, Catherine, which goes to 2100. Uh, it's one of the longest plans in any country. Uh, and, and Bangladesh is one of the countries with Dutch assistance uh, to have done that exercise all the way to 2100, which is now 80 years away. Um, and at the same time, in different sectors on conservation and biodiversity, we have had plans on climate change. We've had a climate change strategy and action plan. We are now in the process of having our a new plan called the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan that's going to be announced very soon and that will take uh, the next uh, uh, five, five plus five years. So it's a it's a climate uh, based uh, uh, um, in investment plan. To make the country prosperous and the the narrative change is to go from uh, a resilience, which is becoming uh, managing the risk of climate impacts to prosperous, which is overcoming those risks and becoming prosperous despite those risks. And that is the ambition and the idea that uh, Bangladesh is trying to put forward. It's in fact a result of a collective exercise of vulnerable countries under something called the Climate Vulnerable Forum. It's 48 of the most vulnerable countries. It's a political forum started 10 years ago by then President Nasheed of the Maldives, and it has continued since then uh, with every two years a government leader, uh, head of government, uh, being in charge. At the moment, it is Bangladesh's Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina who is in charge for two years, which will include the upcoming COP26. She's in fact right now in New York at the General Assembly. She attended the meeting on Monday uh, with the uh, Secretary General and uh, Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister on climate change, representing the Climate Vulnerable Forum countries. So Bangladesh is playing a very, very active and very prominent role at the global stage uh, this year and next year uh, on behalf of the Climate Vulnerable Forum countries. And one of the aspects of that is to share Bangladesh's knowledge and experience with other countries. And this brings me to the second uh, part of what I want to uh, um, uh, talk about, which is the need to uh, factor in uh, timescales of what can be done within different timescales. And in particular, uh, what the role of time bound projects can be towards longer term objectives. Um, as you all uh, know, uh, 
projects come uh, with uh, budgets and timelines, usually uh, three to five years, uh, sometimes a bit longer, seven years, uh, but quite um, um, unusual to have longer projects than that. And so uh, in the context of dealing with problems like uh, biodiversity loss, preventing it or conserving biodiversity, as well as dealing with climate change, these are long term issues that uh, a, a time bound, a medium term or even a short term project is not going to solve. And so we have to find ways in which these projects can contribute to these longer term uh, um, activities. And there are three dimensions in which that needs to be done. Firstly, there is generating knowledge on the issue. A project can generate a good amount of knowledge. Uh, secondly, it can also produce capacity. It can build capacity of the different uh, stakeholders, both within government and outside government. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and it can put in place uh, longer term planning perspectives. And as Hasib has just mentioned earlier, uh, putting it into the national plans, the eighth five year plan, the ninth five year plan, the perspective plan, the delta plan. These are all ways in which we can uh, quote unquote mainstream these ideas into national planning. And that is, I would say, where we stand with regards to nature based solutions. So nature based solutions as a phrase is a relatively new phrase. But as a concept is a fairly old concept. Sometimes we used to call this eco ecosystem based uh, development or, or adaptation to climate change, uh, but it has a, a fairly long history in Bangladesh, an organic history of using nature, working with nature, living with nature that is now being captured in this relatively new phraseology of nature based solutions, which has caught on at the global level and is now being uh, taken forward in different countries uh, in, in different ways, and Bangladesh is one of those countries. So we are very much involved. Hasib and I have been working on this for some time now in normalizing this concept, you know, getting people to understand what do we mean by nature based solutions? How can we take it forward and what can kind of evidence at the national scale can we generate to be able to influence decision making and most importantly investments uh, where the money goes is the most important uh, a decision that we want to influence. And so we have set up this network, the Bangladesh Network on Nature Based Solutions, together with uh, our friends in Oxford University. Uh, they have a global network. We have the Bangladesh Network as part of that global network. And one of the things we aim to do, we've done a few, not many, to answer Steve's question, is to have georeference locations of examples of nature based solutions being done. Uh, we have a few of them. We're trying to collect more. And we hope over time that we will be able to populate in a georeference manner on a map of Bangladesh the different nature based solution activities that different organizations are doing, uh, the government organizations, NGOs, uh, um, and, and uh, others as well. So, um, one of the aspects of uh, working in, in a projectized modality, which is the, the main way of working is to find ways in which projects can contribute to longer term processes. So a project is no longer just something that should deliver, uh, do something during the project period and deliver some benefits to some people, which is good. They should do that, but they should certainly think beyond that uh, short term, uh, small scale uh, intervention and result and think about how the lessons and the learning and the evidence can go into national uh, de uh, decision making at multiple layers. And this brings me to my third and final point, uh, which is the need for multi stakeholder or what is now uh, fashionably called a whole of society approach. And I would argue that Bangladesh is actually quite good at doing this. Uh, we have a whole of society approach to the 17 uh, su sustainable development goals uh, taking place. Uh, within government, there's a, a whole of government support uh, system uh, to do deliver on the 17 sustainable development goals and outside government. We also have different stakeholder groups, including civil society, academic and research institutions like mine, um, uh, private sector, 
particularly private sector investors, bankers and insurance industry, um, youth, young people, extremely important uh, stakeholder group, women's group separately, taking into account the gender sensitivity and the gender requirements, um, and then uh, media as well, media extremely important. A stakeholder group that we need to bring on board and we are doing that. So Bangladesh is in the process of uh, taking a very whole of society approach. Uh, I won't call it perfect. It, it, it's far from perfect, but at least it, the intention is there. Uh, the desire is there and we are trying to do a few things uh, um, at the at the moment and hopefully we'll be able to build on them. And in the context, I'll give an example of climate change where I work. And then I'll end with how this might uh, translate into the nature based solution arena. In the climate change arena, for more than a decade, we have been doing quite a lot of work on climate change. Bangladesh is one of the most vulnerable countries. We knew this uh, well over 12 years ago. We built, we developed our own climate change strategy and action plan. We, in fact, set up a climate change trust fund where the Minister of Finance every year puts in about 100 million euros to implement the plan. And uh, over the last 10 years, we've spent more than a billion euros of our own money in implementing hundreds of actions and activities and learning from them and then mainstreaming that into the national planning process. So the eighth five year plan is integrating climate change across the plan and in the budget, the national budget, as Hasib mentioned earlier, um, addressing climate change is a very high priority and uh, several billion dollars of the national budget across 25 different ministries are allocated to climate change, tackling climate change. And in fact, we have a climate change budget, a sub budget within the national budget uh, in Bangladesh at the moment. Nearly 8% of the national budget goes towards tackling climate change. So climate change is a good example over the last, I would say, one and a half decade where we have started to take this issue seriously. We have made very strong progress in implementing uh, the learning that we have made and putting it into practice and into decision making and into investments, particularly investments going forward. Um, and I, I see uh, the op opportunity for doing the same with nature based solutions going forward. A lot of interest in it, a lot of activity beginning, uh, not as much as there was before, a lot more now um, and an opportunity to mainstream the concepts and ideas into national decision making. Uh, uh, both for the government, for public sector enterprises and public sector investments, but also very importantly to private sector investors as well. And um, we would be very happy uh, to explore ways in which we can collaborate. I think there's opportunities for um, learning across uh, the two countries, Bangladesh and the Netherlands. We're already doing that. We have been doing that for a very long time in the water sector. Uh, almost all the Bangladeshi uh, water engineers have been trained in the Netherlands. We have a long history of collaboration. We are now expanding that beyond water to deal with uh, climate change and nature based solutions. So let us see if we can uh, uh, design something more proactively going forward to build on the excellent foundations that we already have uh, in terms of collaboration between the two countries and on the, the issue of nature based solutions, both at the national level in the Netherlands and Bangladesh, we learn from each other, but also globally at the global level as well. I'll stop there and happy to take questions. Giving us a clear picture of the, yeah, the broader, uh, uh, the broader picture that we need to take into account uh, and that we need to work on and um, yeah, what I, I recognize in your presentation, what I also recognized in in the press or online, uh, that you are uh, in your country, you are working on a, uh, yeah, on a quite uh, structured way towards uh, certain goals, and uh, yeah, that makes it uh, and that that's important uh, also uh, for us as, as I'm an engineer and I've always worked in the consulting uh, industry, so I'm a very project oriented person, so. If you want to advance something, uh, you need to work with uh, policy makers uh, because otherwise, uh, yeah, your your project will not fly. Eh? Um, and uh, that's a that's a very good perspective with regard to your uh, offer to uh, collaborate. Yeah, well, uh, of course we are very uh, open to uh, explore that, and uh, yeah, we we see uh, what you are doing. Um, 
we think we can uh, benefit from that. And I hope that we will also be able to offer something to Bangladesh that you uh, will be able to benefit from. So I would like to, uh, yeah, to start uh, yeah, what, what we mentioned, the panel discussion. So the, the three speakers have opened uh, their camera. And um, I, I would like to start with, uh, with, the, with the question, uh, which I think there is a lot of uh, aspects there about uh, the polder system. Um, now I have to scroll back in the chat box. Uh, yeah, so it's a question by uh, Nurul Kadir. Um, and um, the question is, uh, what do you think about polder systems? Yeah, so uh, here the question is uh, specific, the polder system at the southern part of the country. Is it possible to convert a polder system into a form of nature-based solutions? And I would like to add to that, are there, in your opinion, uh, alternatives to creating polder systems in deltas with issues uh, such as land subsidence and uh, combating sea level rise? Who, who can I first invite uh, to answer, to reflect on this? Catherine, you want to make something? <laughs> Catherine, please. Oh, okay, Catherine, you yeah, I, I needed, I needed to unmute myself. Apologies for that. Um, uh, I, it's a wide question. Uh, it's a good question. It's not an easy question. And any answer I give, it's never enough. Um, however. Uh, I think it would be very interesting uh, to look at this, to look at this with more people uh, and to think from various perspectives along the three lines that uh, Salim also mentioned about planning, uh, the time scale and uh, uh, how we have a society inclusive way of dealing with this. There are currently already initiatives ongoing, like for instance, the tidal river management option, which is a kind of uh, with the help of the tide, you can um, have the tide coming into the polder and then kind of catch the sediment. And if you can catch the sediment, of course, quicker than the subsidence and the sea level rise, uh, well, then we are in business, right? So that's a way to kind of uh, make the level of the land higher. However, there are a lot of kind of socio-economic uh, kind of preconditions for making this work. So it's not easy. And uh, we do talk about people's lives and livelihoods in those polders. So you cannot just say, OK, uh, let's do it. And then, oh, yeah, those people. So that's. Um, however, I think that the, the current situation is not uh, what, uh, what what people uh, are happy about. It's not what is a kind of sustainable solution for the future. Um, and I think there is no cookbook re recipe of what will happen next. Uh, and it's very interesting to see that in the Delta plan process, uh, also the government is kind of looking into this matter. What could be a longer term approach? Um, however, uh, I, I think this, this needs a lot of kind of piloting, trying, uh, getting people together uh, and moving ahead with no one a particular uh, viewpoint prevailing all the others. Um, you need to juggle all the different interests, people livelihoods, the environment, climate change aspect, uh, income, uh, the national level government, uh, how the water board is going to maintain, etc, etc, etc. So uh, that in short is my answer to the question. OK, thank you, uh, Catherine. I, can I ask uh, Mr. Hook a follow up question about this? Um, so if you look from Bangladesh to our country, uh, yeah, what what do you see uh, in light of climate change and the possibilities to apply nature based solutions? Do you have a, do you have an advice to us what we should do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't be uh, presumptuous enough to advise the Netherlands on uh, how to deal with these issues. You have a, a, a very strong uh, uh, tradition of knowledge and, and practice there. But what I would say is that uh, there is a great deal of opportunity for learning as we go along. 
You know, the situation is never static. Situation is always dynamic. And so today's solution will not work tomorrow. It'll be a new problem. We'll have to adapt to that problem. So we need to, you know, as they say, be adaptive management processes. Um, and in different places, there will be different circumstances, some similarities, some non similarities. You know, every delta has a lot of similarities, but a lot of each delta is also unique in its features. Um, one of the uh, comparisons that can be made between the Netherlands and Bangladesh is that our delta is far, far bigger. As Catherine said, our rivers are huge uh, compared to the ones you have in the Netherlands. Uh, secondly, you have the ability, the technology and the funding uh, to have these massive sea walls uh, to protect the the, uh, the country from the sea level rise in particular. In Bangladesh, that is a limited capacity. Embankments are one. We have built embankments. We are strengthening those embankments to make them more uh, resistant to sea level rise, but not all of them will be able to do that. Uh, so we, it's a much more complex uh, ecosystem in which we have to a workout with local people, you know, between farmers and fishers who have uh, opposite uh, views of wh what should be done. One group wants the water to come in, one group doesn't want the water to come in. So we have to uh, balance all these factors in making decisions, even at a very micro scale, and then uh, scale that up to a more macro scale. Um, and in particular, in Bangladesh, broadly speaking, across our coastal zone, I would say there are three major uh, um, types of coasts that we need to take into consideration. There's the Sundarban forest, which I see mentioned, which is a mangrove forest that takes care of that uh, covers a significant part of our coastline in the uh, south uh, western part. Then there is the major delta areas of the big rivers, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna rivers. This is across the central part of the country from the southwest to central and then we have the southeastern part where we have Chittagong and Coxe Bazar, which is somewhat different. These are not necessarily deltas. They're more stable uh, coastlines uh, beach. We have a very big beach in Coxe Bazar, for example. So we need to disaggregate the different uh, ecosystems on the coast, different groups on the coast, urban areas versus rural areas, uh, different kind of agricultural practices versus uh, um, you know, shrimp farming, for example, is another practice going on in the saline uh, zones. So highly complex ecosystem, highly complex social systems uh, that need to be taken into account in going thing, going forward, which is why I, I uh, um, emphasize the need for a multi stakeholder approach. You know, an engineer cannot solve the problem. Uh, a politician cannot solve the problem. Uh, a social scientist alone can't solve the problem. We all need to work together and try to figure things out. And and there's no permanent solution. We'll do. It's a trial and error uh, system of of uh, tackling uh, the problems. So climate change, adapting to climate change is inherently trial and error. And we do things, and we learn by doing things, and then we learn what not to do and what to do more of. And and that's how we learn and go up the knowledge ladder. And, and the final point I'll make is that it is not, in the case of Bangladesh and Netherlands, what we do is not only relevant for our countries, it's relevant for the whole world. And so, you know, we are generating, we're at the cutting edge of Delta management and Delta adaptation. And if we join forces, we can not only learn from each other, but we can generate globally uh, useful knowledge for the rest of the world, particularly other deltas around the world who uh, could benefit from our experience uh, and our knowledge. I hope that answers your question. Well, it more than does, and uh, thank you for this uh, yeah, uh, insights that you are giving us. Uh, adaptation is trial and error by uh, nature, and what we do uh, as a Bangladesh and the Netherlands is relevant for the whole world. I think we should, uh, we should keep that in mind uh, when we go back to our daily business. Um, there is a question I would like to pose to uh, Hasib. Uh, it's a question uh, of uh, Mr. Ibrahim. Um, some, uh, some climate experts say uh, that island nations like the Maldives cannot be saved by nature-based solutions and they must use hard engineering. How do you see that? Uh, no, thank you very much for the question. It is also uh, true for the other uh, question I have seen. 
for Bangladesh, how, how, how realistic it is for Bangladesh to uh, adopt nature-based solution. As I have mentioned, we have to realize the limitations of nature-based solution. Planting a tree will not give you the benefit you actually demand from it or expect from it in the long run. So you have to wait for it. So in many cases, definitely you need to go for hard engineering. But where opportunities uh, are uh, present, like uh, the southeastern part, southwestern part of Bangladesh, uh, Dr. Nurul Kadir mentioned that area. Uh, we have seen that outside the polders, there is a there is a thick belt of mangroves that is created, uh, which actually saves uh, or act as the first defense. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Defense uh, first first layer of defense. So we need to think of how to combine green and gray, but we need to appreciate the limitations of nature-based solution uh, as well and work in that line. Can I answer another question that is give, given that what are the three lessons uh, we can learn from nature-based solution experience in Bangladesh? May I ask, may I respond to that? Thank you. Oh, sorry, I was uh, muted. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, but to me, the, uh, the three points that we have learned over the last uh, couple of decades, I would suggest is we need to think nature-based solution beyond our project. It might be driven by a project, but it shouldn't end by a project because uh, as uh, we have to uh, think beyond project dependency mindset. We need to think from a program to this working with nature as working with people but we work both with nature and people as you do in need to realize that uh, change takes time in this third we have to be patient about it. Uh, and we, it is true for the government true for the ngos and it is also true for the development part the final one is we need to come out of five Piloting mindset or having the mindset of scaling up as, as Dr. Hawk. I see. I see. Can I interrupt you? Has, please? has been saying over the last couple of years that. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, the, the connection is very poor. So what you are saying is uh, in, uh, extremely valuable, but. The parts of it are uh, not audible for us. Um, so maybe uh, if it is possible uh, for you uh, to put it in a mail to me or something, I can share it uh, with the person yeah, who asked the question. Can you hear me now? Yes, it seems to be better. Very quickly, we need to change our project mindset. We need to go for program. We need to realize that working with nature and people takes time, so we have to be patient. By we, I mean development partner, uh, the, the implementing agencies, and the, the community itself. And the final uh, learning point, I would say, we need to shift our project or project piloting mindset and move to scaling up mindset. Uh, uh, so that's the three lessons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Es. I see this was very clearly audible. Um, I would like to go back to the, the question of Mr. Azos Klein, which he asked us uh, previously. <clears throat> if we want to select and prioritize uh, nature-based solutions, are there any biodiversity guidelines which can be used in the selection or prioritization of these uh, solutions? Who, who has an opinion about that? Or do you know about any guidelines? I can, I can Perhaps question needs to be a bit of clarity, if I can. Clarity, Mr. Heng, I don't think you actually understood the question. I should repeat the questions for everybody okay. understanding. Shall I say? Shall I say go? Yep. Yes, please. So, but yeah, Mr. Short. yeah, the question is, is that, uh, you know, the Bangladesh is having a lot of uh, development projects, every department's. Every ministry is making a lot of projects, major projects, you know, all infrastructure development projects, you know, it's all good for the country, for sure. Uh, what I was asking is that whether we have developed 
uh, any policies or any guidelines or any kind of threshold which determines that this project can be funded and can be enlisted in the five-year plan or Delta plan for funding. And uh, if it is, uh, let me know, uh, because what I know is basically planning ministry, uh, which is basically, in my opinion, is the second economic ministry of the, uh, of the country. It doesn't really do the planning, the physical planning, as, as everybody know about it. So uh, how we can influence that policy, and the only thing I, I know that the way to influence is that if you can actually put the environmental thinking and nature-based solution thinking at the forefront of, uh, of the, any project planning assessment works, then obviously that will, that, that will actually uh, achieve the objective, help achieve the objective that we are talking about here. So my okay. question is, what is the biodiversity threshold that will actually distinguish between the projects that can be subject to funding and that uh, some projects that require further works to be satisfactory? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Asos. Anyone would like to react on that? Do you I have an opinion for uh, Asif? Okay, yeah. Asif, please. Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, Dr. Hawk, would you, would you please say first, then I can tell Sure, in. okay. So uh, the short answer to your question, uh, is, as is that it is not happening, uh, but it is in the process and can happen. And I'll give you an example of where it is happening, which is in the issue of climate change that I mentioned. So over the last dozen years, Climate change has been going up the agenda in importance. Capacity has been built uh, in the planning process and in the program uh, uh, process as well. So at the moment in the, in the planning commission, there are two divisions. There is the general economics division that does the planning. That's a big division there that you usually think about them as the planners. But then there's also a programming division who actually have to look at all each plan in particular and vet them to see whether they are in consonance with Bangladesh's national objectives. And they are now acquiring the capacity. There's a lot of training going on and uh, tool making going on for them to assess the climate change viability of uh, the projects and proposals that they get. Uh, and they are now including that and they are becoming capable of doing that. Now, I don't think they're capable of doing biodiversity and nature-based solution yet, uh, but we can start. The, we can, uh, it'll, it'll take time. It can be done. Uh, and I think they would be willing to do it. So let us see if we can actually make that happen. Um, it can be done. I am quite confident it can be done, but it will take a concerted effort by all the stakeholders that can contribute to making that happen. Over to you, Asif. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hogg. Very quickly, I would like to focus on nature-based solution and biodiversity. Yes, things are changing. Over the last year or so, uh, Bangladesh Planning Commission is implementing a project called National Resilience Program. Although in originally it was planned to train government officials to learn about disaster impact assessment, but in the middle of the training, they have realized that they need to put a nature-based solution module in it. Them, uh, uh, it shows that the things are changing, even for nature-based solution. But the point that you have made, Mr. Izaz, no, we do not have that kind of threshold. But there is a provision uh, under when the government project is being prepared. We call it DPP, Development Project Pro Forma. Under Section 24, it talks about biodiversity. It talks about ecosystem as a cross-cutting issue. But there is no threshold. But I think we are uh, uh, heading to the right direction. Thank you very much for raising this issue. OK, thank you. Um, we are also nearing uh, the scheduled uh, end time of this uh, webinar. Uh, we did not touch upon all the questions. Uh, I'm sorry for that, but I also wouldn't like to keep you from uh, the rest of your business today. Um, the, uh, I will try to come back uh, uh, on some of the questions. Uh, we, we will save the chat. We will have your contact details and try to come back on that. Um, yeah, I would like to thank the audience for attending. Uh, I think that this uh, webinar was a, a great uh, opportunity to learn more about uh, what's going on in Bangladesh and how they are assuming 
uh, yeah, an exemplary role in the field of nature-based solution. Um, I would like to thank, of course, uh, the speakers for excellent presentations. Um, uh, Katharine, uh, Hasib and uh, Salim. Um, yeah, we are very grateful for, uh, for what you have shared with us and your insights. We have recorded the webinar. If anybody would like to, uh, to, to uh, take a look at some part of it or repeat it, uh, we will publish it through our website in the coming few days. So, uh, and probably under the news uh, section. And um, yeah, uh, last but not least, um, yeah, I would like to wish you all uh, a very pleasant day. And I hope that at some point in the future, uh, we will be able to meet again around this interesting and uh, challenging topic. And thank you all uh, for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very Bye. much.